Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Trust and Atira this evening. Um, we're delighted to be joined by Catherine Power. Uh, she's back with us again for a second lecture. Catherine is uh, an archaeologist, a physical anthropologist, and she's a lot of other titles to her name. Um, she's worked for many years as Cork County archaeologist, and she's worked on investigations with the Gardaí, and she's worked on numerous sites uh, all over Ireland, really. Uh, in her spare time, Catra is also an accomplished and award-winning author. And tonight she joins us and she's going to be telling us about some of the skeletons in her closet. You're very welcome, Catra. Thanks very much for the invitation, Liam. It's a great, it's a great website, your class and a hero, well done. Um, the title of the, of the talk, talk tonight is What Have I Learned After a Few Thousand Skeletons in My Cupboard? The, the word originally comes from closets, in my closet, and what how it came about in the 19th century. Before the 19th century, the British Parliament um, had, a, I think, 1832, there was a le piece of legislation passed that executed criminals could no longer be, could no longer be used for, um, for studying autopsies by doctors and so on. And before that, um, it was if you had an if you had an autopsy on a an executed skeleton or a criminal, you wouldn't keep it in your surgery, so to speak. So everybody assumed that a medical doctor was doing his research and so on, um, with a skeleton in their in their closet. And the, the real the word closet is an American version of cupboard. And the reason I use cupboard is because I'll, I'll mention a water closet later on, um, which is um, obviously a toilet, and I, I'll tell you about that. Um, just, I'll just go on to the next slide there. Yeah. Um, skeletons, bodies, um, cremations, mummies, any mummified remains. I can't see you at all, Liam. It's a bit disconcerting there. I'll just see if I can click on you first. But, um, yeah, there, I'm glad I can see somebody now because I couldn't see anybody. It's like talking to myself. Um, archaeologists, one of the things they like to do is look at its skeletons, um, other forms of human remains. We're all sort of interested in human remains because we're all human, obviously, and our mortality and what happened during our lives, how we're, how we're aged, how we're sexed, what diseases we had. And one of the common things that when we're excavating skeletons, people would ask, well, what do they die from and so on? So obviously we're dealing with dead people and they're a living, a living representation of a population at a certain time. I have examined skeletons from Neolithic times right up to 19th century, from all over Ireland, from Donegal to Cork City, to from Kerry to Armagh, Antrim, and so on. Um, this is a picture of, of, of a, it's a painting that was done in Cork City in the 90s by um, a local artist, and it just shows a representation of people that have different appearances. And I, I use just to talk about the diseases that people had, their ages and a mixture, just shows a good example. The, our our um, urbanization, what skeletons tell us about that. Um, animals, what they tell us about our contact with animals and humans. Are we affected, are, are, are our skeletons, our bodies affected by our association with animals and so on. And I suppose it's it's more, um, now with the pandemic that we have, it's um, more, I suppose the talk about pandemics and our association with animals is very meaningful at the moment. But throughout human history and prehistory as well, obviously we don't know as much about prehistory, but we always were in, where we were interconnecting and communicating with animals or creatures that had diseases. And there were always plagues. Um, if for instance, Thucydides, one of the historians in Greece um, in prehistoric times or the early written times, he actually describes a pandemic in Athens that lasted for 10 years and a large part of the population died from, from that. And it was a hot, sweaty sort of plague that they had. Sometimes some of these plagues, we don't know what they were. Um, you can only guess that they're something like the ones that we're suffering today, like the flu epidemic. They had the sweats in medieval times and so on. So uh, that's just an introduction now to um, what we're talking about this year, really. The types of human remains then that you find, you have the dry bone skeleton, you have a mummy, which is either a preserved, a naturally preserved 
person or it's um, a, a, a man-made mummification with oils and resins that usually you find we associate with pharaohs of Egypt. I have looked at one mummy in, in my time, one that was um, in UCC. It's, I don't know where it is now. It's probably still part of the Boo Library in UCC, but it was, um, we examined it. We brought it to the CUH in the in 1980s for x-rays to see if, if there was anything inside in the mummy and what it suffered from and so on. There's actually a master's thesis done on the mummy you see. Um, and the, the, the other types of remains then are um, cremations. These are burnt um, human bones. Cremation was common throughout the world. Um, you, I mean, it looks as if it's, I don't know if I, I, I can't point out, but you see the the pot that's there with little bits of bone in it. Um, when you examine something like that, one that I excavated in, in Tipperary years ago, I took it, I excavated it by taking out a couple of centimeters at a time to see what was put into the pot first and what was put in last. So I excavated it in spits, if you like, to give a better story. So it was like an archeological excavation of the pot itself. And over the years, I've looked at several um, tons of cremated bone. For now, the passage tomb in the Boyne Valley, I looked at eight stone, a sample of the remains in there. I looked at eight stone of bone. I can tell you I was fed up with looking at after eight stone of cremated bone. All the size that you can see there, you can see the relevant size. And if you look closely at those bits of, of bone, they're actually ide identifiable. You see, they're all different. and when you when you, when somebody's cremated, I mean we all have the same anatomical structure, and it breaks down in a certain definite way. I mean the the a pelvis was was split in a in a in a furnace in a certain fashion, and so will all the other bones, and they're quite recognisable. You can see under the two centimetre point mark there, there's a, a large bone, and that looks as if it's a femur. It's different colour because it looks probably it might have been um, might have got as much heat as as a white calcined piece of bone, but it, it depends on the cremation the cremation method. Cremation, I mean, in prehistoric Ireland, cremations were really well done. They were they had a, a huge, a long a long I suppose history of techniques of cremation. And if you look at the the examples of the bone again in front of you, there is. At the bottom, there's a white one with a little bit of blue on it, and that's a bit of the skull. So you can identify each and every type of bone to something. You can either say it's a long bone or a cranial fragment, or maybe a small. You can find fetal remains even. They're actually cosseted in the, in the, the, in the pregnant woman when they're burned and they're protected. And you can find little fetal teeth in a cremation. And the other thing that I had numbers of, I found 40, numbers of 40 individuals in the cremation, eight stone in, in now. And it's part of, I was one of the research, I was probably one of the first to do a study with, um, of modern techniques, if you like, on cremation with Robin O'Sullivan. And it's in a book now that um, George Hogan has published. There's a, a, a special book, there's several books on now. And one of them is um, on the human remains and the people that lived in now. And what, what we do find about the cremations in, in past tombs is that there's an awful lot of cremation bone missing and it gives you another sense of story. What's happening there? Are the bones winnowed maybe and put into the river vine to the goddess of the vine? This is what I'm just making up, you know, it's, an, it's a theory. And um, I mean, there are always bones, cremated bones missing. Where are they buried somewhere else? Do they have two different, do they, are, are maybe some of the bones um, left out and picked by, you know, um, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a scaffolding and maybe they're not all burned. But then again, you would, you would see the difference between dry bone burn and flesh covered bone burned. The, the, the specialist would know the difference. So, um, I have actually a, quite a detailed report on a, on a cremation study in my blog. It's a County Limerick site and it's been 
examined by people, by forensic scientists in Mexico and Spain. They actually, I see them regularly looking at the site, you know, and um, it, it tells you everything you need to know about cremation. The next thing is you can find human remains anywhere. As I said, I found some in a, an old outhouse in Yale years ago. The police actually found in within two, within two weeks, they had two forensic situations in Yale where I lived for years. One of them was down the road, about five doors from where I lived. There was a head and shoulders of an adolescent found under the floor in a house on the edge of the medieval town of Yale. Now, what had happened was there were builders in there across from the, the um, Dole office, and some of them were actually, they were supposed to be not working. And they were in, and they, they, I'd say they dug through the floor and, and hit upon the skeleton, the head and shoulders, before they realised what was happening. They were afraid to go to report it to the police because the Dole office was across the road, and they'd all got in there earlier before the Dole office opened, so they were in at three, nine in the morning. So the state pathologist eventually was asked go down, Margaret Bolton was asked to go down and she, she said, no, it's probably archaeological. When I went down, I the, everything was removed. The, the head and shoulders were removed and they were above the flooring. So I, I couldn't determine where the skeleton had been and that was all that was there of the skeleton. So there was a huge mystery in Yale at the time, whose head and shoulders were there. It was a, an adolescent about late, late teens, early 20s and it could have come from anywhere. It could have been, the sea would have come up as far as that area and it could have been, somebody might have just been buried there, but there was no sign of cause of death. There was very little to say except that it was part of the skull and part of the scapula and uh, clavicles of, a, of, a, of a, an adolescent man, a young man. Um, but within a fortnight, there was another skeleton found in an outhouse in Yall as well on the back street, maybe about half a mile from this other one. And again, it caused a lot of um, controversy. But it was found when this man, he, he, bought, he bought a Georgian house in Yale and he was cleaning it out and there was an old water closet, an old toilet, a wooden toilet in the garden outside in, in the garden. And it was full of bones. Now they weren't all human bones. They were actually animal bones that were stacked in there. And what had happened was there was one cranium, the skull vault of an adolescent again, a young man. How it got there, I don't know. It was right in the middle of all these bones and it was a full-size outdoor toilet. But what the, the gentry in those days would have had cattle coming in on foot, on, on hoof, into the back, up the lane, into the back garden and into the cellar where they were butchered. And you had all these ancient hooks in cellar in the basement where they hung up the meat and everything. And I presume they just filled for some reason, they, I don't know what reason, but they would have, the, the, the water closet was used as storage. And in the middle there was this half a, half a skull of a, an adolescent. Now the man, we don't, we, I couldn't tell anything about it. There was nothing on it. It was just, there was no cause of death. There was no disease. There was nothing on it. And um, so all I could say, uh, I mean, there were suggestions. Again, the former owner of the, was a commander of the British, of the British Army in India. And they were saying, oh, it, it was a, 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 a sort of a talisman that he had from India, but I don't know. Could easily have come from a nearby graveyard. But this is, you, you find, I found human remains outside a shoe shop, a medieval shoe shop in North Main Street in Cork. Where they, how they got into a drain, I don't know. So you can get human remains anywhere. They're not always murder. They can be taken by a dog and dragged down the street, you know, from a graveyard or whatever. So these are just, these were in Yall, these ones as well. You can see two long bones sticking out. These look like femora or thigh bones. And maybe it's a burial. I, I, I don't think it was, so I can't, I can't remember this, except that you can see there's a nice deposit there with some bones, but they're all mixed up. And these were down in, these were Kinsale actually, these ones rather than Yall. Um, and again, it, it brought to light a, a great, that was nearby. This is a picture of the old clock tower. This is to remind me to talk of the old and the skeletons that were in the old, so I could talk about it before. This actually image is back to front. If you know the old, you know that it's not the right way to look at it. <laughs>
and uh, I mean, a common place for burials, obviously, are, are churches and graveyards and cemeteries. Cemetery is somewhere where you don't have a, a church. And a lot of people don't realise that a graveyard is the, are the graves in the yard associated with the church. And a cemetery is something that's not with a church. There's a slight difference. But over the years, I've looked at uh, several hundreds of skeletons from excavated old um, disused cemeteries and graveyards. Um, for instance, I've looked at some from Limerick, from Waterford, from Clonmel, from Cork, from Dublin. Most towns really, Armagh uh, as well. Um, any, uh, I've looked at famine graveyards um, or cemeteries from Mayo. I could go on and on and on. I had um, an, an early Christian or an early medieval fort in County Tyrone that had a, a very, very badly preserved um, skeletons. And I think I mentioned that at the last talk that I was on, that there were 1,200 people represented by teeth only, by enamel, because the soil had eroded the, the, uh, the bone. It was a very acidic soil. And this is just a, a table top tomb. And when you visit a graveyard, you'll actually see lots of bone disturbed in the soil from grave diggings as well. Um, I remember somebody said to me that when they were at a, a modern burial, they, they were delighted. I taught paleogemography in UCC for nearly 20 years. I taught people what a bone was, what a human bone was. I taught them how to age and sex a skeleton, what diseases they might find. We did reconstruction of skulls as well. So this girl, this this ex student of mine said she was at a, at a funeral and she could see in the soil the bones that had been disturbed over the years they were in the soil. And she said she spent her time trying to identify them rather than taking heed of the, the funeral, you know. But um, we'll go on to the next one. This is a typical archaeological excavation of skeletal remains, a disused cemetery in Waterford in the 80s. You can see lots of discoloration in the soil where there were and post holes and post pits that were dug in and over the skeletons. So the, the cemetery was disused. It was forgotten. If you, if you remember a lot of um, the churches with um, Henry VIII and all that in the 16th and 17th century, churches came, became disused. And um, a lot of medieval and probably 16th and 17th century pre and up to the 16th, 17th century, skeletal remains assemblages are, are sometimes on, on, in, undi, in unknown spots, really. They're actually discovered at the last minute. Um, this one, you can see clusters of burials where there are fam family burials together. And you can see a lot of disturbance where grave diggers have cut into the skeletal remains in the burials over the years. I mean, when you're, when you're, when you're a grave digger, and you're digging into a ground that has a grave already in it, a burials in it, you won't, you won't think of the body. You think of the skull as representing person, and it's higher up usually, and it's more robust. So that's why you always see a clearance around the, the skulls, and sometimes the ribs and the vertebrae are actually cleaned and spread to the side because they're not recognisable to people, to the grave diggers as such, you know. So you see lots of different variation in burials there. You see uh, different ages, you see different cuts in and, in and over one another. You can see the cut, cuts of the grave as well. And you can see on the, low, on the right hand side is part of the burial there, which um, part, of the, part of the burial is gone, it's been dug out for something that happened above it. And above it, there were houses put in Waterford City. And that's what disturbed this grave and made it forgotten. But it's, it's quite common to have something like that happen in Ireland and in other European countries. This is, um, I, this is what you can do with a mass of bones that are just seemingly dumped uh, in, in a hole in the ground, really. And this was a burial site that I used to teach. I wasn't at the site, but the information from it, it's an Ananamai burial site in Washington, in, near Washington, DC. And it shows you how to, it, I used it for my paleodemography class, it shows you what you can get out of a, a jumble of bones. If you look very carefully at the, the, the remains, these heap of bones, 
the side profile shows a, a pit, a large pit that is a different colour than the natural ground below it. You can see the ground that one is walking on from the photographer's point of view. It's a lighter, whiter grey, and there's a darker soil then in the bank. And that there's a pit there, a huge pit. And once or twice, I suppose in every maybe maybe every three to ten years all the human the, the human remains were deposited in a, in an ossuary or, or a hole in the ground in this case. And there were two of these ossuaries, they called it simply ossuary one and ossuary two. They were found when people were digging drainage in their land. These farmers were digging, digging for a, a drainage stream. And these are what the excavator and the paleopathologist, et cetera, found about these two ossuaries is that one they had had one identified as pre the other from looking at the health and looking at the history looking at the object the flint remains that were associated with them and looking carefully they found a massive amount of information as well as disease age and sex of the individuals if you look carefully you can see col there's a column of, ver of vertebral remains that are one on top of the other, they're articulated. That means they're in their human position, their human anatomical position. And it shows that the bodies were not just thrown in as disarticulated or single boned. There was a mixture. There were single bones, completely disarticulated or disjointed, totally, they were put in. There were also partially articulated remains put in. You can see there's a skull there in the middle and there's a femur and a, and a tibia at a right angle. You can see there was a leg put in in complete articulation. They were jointed. Oh, on the lower side, again, you can see a hip bone, a pelvis with a femur articulated. So when you look at all of that and you look closely, you can see the remains can consist of our disarticulated remains and partially articulated remains. So it shows you something about the custom of those Nanomai people. They were the Algonquian people, as far as I can recall, in that area of Maryland, um, Washington, D.C. area. And the reason I, I actually include this is because I, did, I got some scholarships to go to Washington to the Smithsonian years ago to do pathology. And one of my teachers, John Ortner, was involved in a book involving this publication. And what, what, what the partial articulation and the disarticulated bones indicate is that every few years there was a ceremony and all the remains, the remains were probably put away. Let's say when somebody died, they were put on a scaffolding or in a mortuary house where they rotted, either rotted in, in, a, in a mortuary house or externally. And at a certain time, let's say it's Christmas Day every three years, they were going to have a ceremony. And no matter what way the bodies had rotten, you were going to be interred at that stage. Now, because they actually found um, a lot of the little ba the little tiny bones, the, the, the finger bones and the toe bones, they found those gathered together. And they felt that the, that the big bones were collected first. You, like if you're told to go and collect something, you pick the big the skulls up first and bring them from A to B. It could be down the road, a mile down the road, or it might have been in a field next door. And they deposited the remains with the big bones first, and then they put the little bones in. Um, and they also found a collection of adolescent bones together in one area. And they one of the suggestions was was it um, a, a feast or um, an, a coming up to a coming out of adolescence that they were incorporated into a special ceremony as well. And the, the book is fascinating. It goes into the detail of all of the reasons why, why it could have this hypothesis about, about them. And also one of the periods before the pe people were conquered by the Europeans as well. It's a really fascinating study. There's a, you can see a partially articulated person. You can see um, the ribs are together with the vertebrae. It's a bit, it's upside down, but that's the way it was, like, obviously the photograph is taken. But um, you can see the vertebrae, a bit of a clavicle, some, um, some, some, rib, some ribs, and they're all jointed with a, a right um, humerus, a right upper arm. Um, so after that, um, 
the other types of things that one would look for in human remains and what, what kind of pathology we can find. Um, simple pathology, complicated pathology. Now, the one thing to remember is that um, you, can, you don't get all the diseases on a skeleton that would have affected the person during life. Um, and again, a doctor, if we go to a doctor, he'll only look at what, we, what our fleshy part. He doesn't, he doesn't see either what's in the bone. So you get two different viewpoints, if you like. This is one of the simplest and most common fractures that you can get in a human, even in a, in a fleshy remains. It's, you can see there's a bit of a rib and there's a bump in the middle. And you can see I have a narrow on the right hand side there, in my right anyway. And it shows that I just, I use these skeletal diagrams to show where the bone is if you've forgotten your biology over the years and anatomy. So it's a rib, it's a bit of a rib with a fracture, but the fracture has healed. Now I'm not sure what rib it is because the rest of the remains, the ends are missing. But it shows that there's healing, good healing in that particular bone person cracked a rib from a fall, from a punch, bumping into something. But, but in all the, in modern, in modern times, in hospital situations, modern medicine, one of the most common bones to fracture is, is, a, is a rib bone anyway. And the same from skeletal assemblages, rib bones and collar bones are actually very frequently fractured. And they heal very well as well because they're nicely, um, Cosseted and held tight within the human being, really, they can heal very easily. You could, you could, a, a rib fracture could heal without even going to a doctor. Not that I don't, re I don't recommend that, but you know, it would heal very well. The same as some foot bones as well. They're nice and tightly bound, if you like. Then the, this is another type of simple type of pathology, and again, you see the skull, and I have the skull in the proper position so that you see exactly where they're coming from. The top of the skull, you see a little porosity, a circle where the, where the arrow is. That is a circular dent in the skull. And one of the suggestions that I have, I don't know what implement it, um, made the mark, but it's an indent uh, on the skull. It's flattened. You can see the circle around it and there's porosity. So the, the porosity indicates that there was some healing involved. So, uh, and also there's, it's, it's actually dented as well. So the person probably got a bang or a belt of a hammer, like the hammer I have down below. And you can see the, 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 on the right hand side, there's a rounder version of the dent of the, the hammer, the side of the hammer, there's a more flattened part. So you can, from skeletal remains and other remains as well, you could suggest the cause of injuries. You can do a re every, I used to, um, for Halloween, I used to do a, 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 a sort of a, a a, a, a slideshow for schools where I show them how how you cut off a head and and what marks you'd have from from, the, from a, a, an axe mark or a, you know and we'd do a, a re a reenaction of it as well you know gruesome Halloween things and so on so with reenacting I, I think something like this hammer a war hammer or something like that I'm not sure what you call it nowadays would have but it would a circular end to it would have made that impression. So you're getting a light, you're getting the, the impact of the weapon and front, blunt force trauma you'd hear on the television in these um, forensic programs. But anyway, this person obviously, it was well healed and it shows there was good welfare in, that's a medieval skeleton as well. You know, they had good welfare in those days as well. This is another implement, um, a halberd, I think. But you can imagine the crack that that would have on a body, the mess that it would make compared to the, the other implements we saw before that. I mean, this would, it has a sharp edge and you get the cutting edge, the imprint of the cutting edge on the bone as well. But you could, I'll show you some slides later on of how I can interpret what, what weapons were used on, on bones. And you can see the top end of it, there's a spike at the top. I mean, that again, you, it, you could, it, that would make quite, um, there's a reason for that. If you go into weaponry, there's, there are researchers and interpretation of weapon injuries as well. It's another fascinating topic. And I'm sure the, um, you know, the, the, the reenactors would tell you more about this now than I would know. It's another day's walk, another story for you if you haven't done it already. 
the, then there, there are like the rib fracture is a simple fracture, simple healing as well. This is more of a serious injury. You can see there are two bones, one at right angles to the other. The upper bone is a femur and it's the knee joint with the tibia. So it's your leg. And um, you can see at the bottom, as I, I have no pointer, so I can't point it to you, but you can see at the bottom, the, the, the leg, the knee is actually fused by the patella or the kneecap to the femur. And it was also fused at the bottom to the top of the tibia. So you had a fused or fixed joint. So the person, this is a medieval water person again, man in his 40s or 50s, he actually had to walk with a right angle to his, to his leg for his life after that injury. I x-rayed this and I couldn't find out what had caused the injury. It could have been a clot or it could have been, it could have been, a, it, it was a serious, a, a serious event anyway. It could have been a fall from a great height. Something along those lines would result in a fracture of the, of the, 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 the patella or the kneecap. And um, then, the, but the, the wonderful thing about the body is that it can heal in spite of all of these horrific things that happen. And the bone, re remodeling of the bone, fixing it to joint has healed the, the person. So there's no infection on that bone at all. The little pits you see there are just normal bone structure and vascular structure that's there. So the person, I can't say he lived happily, but he would have dragged his leg. And on his, I had the whole skeleton of this individual and his, his other leg, I think it was the left leg, he had a lot of arthritis on his, on his ankle and joint and on the lower, on the ankle joint and the foot joint. So, uh, I mean, he did suffer. It's a, a situation where somebody did suffer, if you think of what we're looking at are humans and that they are, we show evidence of how they suffered as well as how they lived in, 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 I suppose, in good welfare times. I mean, somebody like this was obviously helped in the community as well. They weren't left just to die with a broken kneecap. You know, they were incorporated into the society in some fashion or other. This is my dog, whom I don't have anymore, but this is to remind me of tapeworms. You would all be going home now and you'd be itching and scratching after the next few slides. <laughs> but, um. I'm always, archaeologists are always interested in detail. And when you're excavating a skeleton or a cremation, you're trying to get the most out of it. So you do it as meticulously as you can. And one of the things I had when I was in America, I had people talking about finding evidence of parasites in coprolites, in, in, in dried feces, in caves and so on. And they found, I thought they were amazing things. Um, ova of parasites, eggs of parasites and so on, and things that people ate. You know, it was just different than over here on this side of the world. And um, when I was excavating three different sites in Munster over the years, I don't know of any other cases of them, but I found three different high dated cysts. One in Kerry, in medieval Kerry, one in 19, 18th, 19th century, um, Tipperary Limerick border and one in Cork. And I, these high dated cysts are caused by the tapeworm, by the larva of the tapeworm. And of course, the dog, if, if, you're, if you know, when you, if you have a dog, you'd be told, is it wormed? And long ago, we were always made wash your hands more times than they are nowadays, even wash your hands and make sure you don't pick up worms from the dog or whatever. And, and so on, you know, so um, hygiene was always important as well with animals. But the high data says, I have this in my blog as well, and I wrote an article with, uh, with a zoologist on it. And um, the larval stage is actually, it, it breeds in the lower, in the small intestine of the dog. And another intermediary in it would be the, a sheep or a pig or cattle. So that the dog would have picked it up from ova in a carcass or maybe in a field or something like that where there was feces as well. And again, the part the human then would pick it up from the dog, from petting the dog and so on. But um, just we'll go on to the next slide before I think. 
you know, before I'll tell you a little bit more of this. The tapeworm, obviously, is, is one of, uh, of a few different types of echinococcus, cococcosis, um, um, granulosis, it's called. It's one of a different type of um, tapeworm. And the hydatidsis get, gets its name from high, anything to do with hydra is water. So it's a watery cyst, but it's not just water it contains. It actually contains little little tapeworms, if you like, little heads of tapeworms. So it's a, a vesicle for the larvae of tapeworms. And sometimes when it goes, when the dog passes it on to the humans, um, in the two, in the two, they might die from the hydatidsis being burst, an anaphylactic shock. Or with the archaeological examples I found, I cannot say with the three people that they died from hydatidosis. What I can say is that they had it at the time of death. Now, one, the man in, in Moore Abbey was actually in his, in his 40s or 50s, a mature man, no other, no other activity. And it was found actually in the, um, the thoracic area. So it might have been the lungs. The lungs and the liver would be where the, the cysts would grow. And um, what I found actually, the, the remnant that I found to give evidence of the hydatidosis was a, a circular hen-sized egg with, with, with um, little holes throughout. So it was a calcified hydatid cyst and it calcified when the cyst apparently was no longer in operation, so to speak, when it was, when it was dead. But I think in modern medicine now you can have daughters and those cysts as well. So I think one cyst could be dead and maybe the others could, could, be, could, could be alive. And you could have something like this for about 10 years um, and, it, and it would kill you, you know, for the 10 years and so on. But um, the two individuals were, were, the other individuals that I found this in were females and they were both pregnant. They died in pregnancy. Now what they died from, I cannot tell. All I can give is the evidence that we found um, in each case, um, a, a pregnant woman with a full term um, a, a fetus engaged at the pelvis, whether they had died from high data disease or whether they had died from labor or an infection due to pregnancy or, or, or labor, I don't know. But all you can do is give the facts and so on. This type of disease is because we have more hygiene in, in, the, in the world today, it's not as common as it used to be, but you st still find it in, in different countries, in third world countries, where they have dogs herding sheep in particular. And you get, I have seen examples of it in um, Algeria, in, I've read uh, articles on examples in Algeria, in New Zealand, in in, in different Asian countries as well. So it's worldwide really. Um, so they're, they're, they're sheep actually from St. John's Well in Mill Street so many moons ago. The other type of parasite that I found um, was this, I don't know if you recognize this, this is a louse. It's a, it's a magnified image of a louse. And, and this is the next one as well. There were two fragments of lice found. I found them in a comb years ago. Um, a body that was excavated outside Dingle in the 1950s, I think, by Professor O'Kelly in UCC. It was a bog body, so it was a flattened body with um, primarily with the clothing uh, preserved and a little bag. It was a child about eight years old. In a piece, what I can't recall what the farmer was doing, but they came across it unexpectedly. And there, there, there was, with the eight year old child, the clothing was sort of medieval, but they said, the, the, I think O'Kelly at the time said that it might be a later um, set of remains that it was probably there from the 17th century, and that the clothing was just rural, out of fashion clothing, if you like, at the time. And there was a little bag with a few toys in it as well. And inside the bag was a little comb. And when the, the, the remains were, I was working in the Department of Archaeology in UCC at the time. And I asked that I look at the comb before they cleaned it, before they were cast. 
until I won't clean it. And sure enough, in between the teeth of the wooden comb were little, two little lies. And I put them on to fly and I gave them to a zoologist friend of mine, whom I often threw things at, bits of hair, um, a, a, a fly one time on a, on a Viking skeleton from Dublin. So they were very handsome zoologists. So he sent these slides to London to an expert in London. And he said that they were lies. They were probably two fragments of two lies. Um, not, we're not sure what kind, I don't know. I actually donated them recently to the, to the uh, museum in Dublin, the, um, the, the Natural History Museum. I sent them off in the slides because I said, like, what am I doing with them still, you know, after all these years? Nobody wants them, to be quite honest. So I sent them off. They were delighted to get them. But the louse is um, transfers, uh, gives people typhus. And this child was buried by herself outside any cemetery. And I, I wonder, was she buried because she had a contagious disease? And the word typhus comes from Greek. It's just, it, it means sweating and um, his, um, derangement as well. It's a terrible disease to get. Um, but it's also a disease that's associated with warfare and starvation. And I wonder, I just, this is for the history part of it. I wonder, was she one of the many that were killed during the, the um, Cromwellian times in, in that part of Kerry where people starved and starvation and typhus go together as well. Um, what else do I have to tell you about that? I probably have loads to tell you. Each one of those slides that I've shown you so far, you could talk, you could have a lecture on each topic, you know. But I have I I haven't seen any other example of a louse in um in Irish archaeology. Maybe there is, but but um this type of louse was a bod a body louse. There are different like lice actually. There's a hair lice, there's a body lice, and there's a pubic lice a louse. And um I think there was some genetic studies done on gorilla lice over the years. And the, our body lice, I think, are quite genetically linked to gorilla lice. And this, this happens like this happened about 700,000 years ago when the habitats that we had were shared by gorillas at a certain time. The humans, they used the same habitat, not necessarily they were living together. But um, and again, um, there's actually a very interesting poem by Robbie Burns and it's about the louse. And he makes a joke of this lady with her very fine hat. She's in a church and she thinks everybody is looking at her. It's to a louse, I think, it's an ode to a louse. And she, he says, uh, he, the, the accent is, I'd love somebody to say it in this Scottish accent, it would be hilarious. And uh, she, she's her head up high, this lady with her lovely bonnet. And she thinks that the low life around her are looking at her beautiful bonnet. But in fact, they're looking at a, 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 a creature that's on her head and it's a louse that's climbing up and down her bonnet. And they're all having quite a laugh at her. You know, it's a very funny, I have it quoted in my blog as well. Um, how are we doing on time? Yeah, we're doing okay. Then on um, skeletal remains and on... Um, in cremations, in, in cremations and skeletal remains in mummies, there are always certain diseases that you can identify. Obviously, a large proportion of diseases occur in our soft tissue, and a lot of it is gone when I come across the skeleton or the cremation. But you can still tell different diseases, infections, anomalies. Um, I had, I've identified people with rickets, for instance, um, a deficiency. One was, a, a deficiency that the person was born with. It was a kidney disorder. So you can identify nutritional disorders. You can identify anemias. You can identify infections, either from trauma or from, from airborne disease. Um, you know, there's a, quite a lot you can look at and find out from skeletal remains, not just the cremations. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can find um, degenerative joint disease on cremations, as well as skeletal remains. Um, you could find tumours, soft tissue tumours on mummies. If you look at the 
the x-rays of the Egyptian mummies and other mummies, you will see um, heart disease recorded and so on. So, you, and or see the, 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 uh, the Iceman, you know, he had a certain diseases as well and degenerative joint disease. And he also had tattoos as well, where he had those um, joint disease. So there's an enormous amount of information. You know, every slide I could give a lecture on, you'd be totally fed up with it. <laughs> but anyway, this is another skeleton that I examined with what I, what I know is an infection. These are the long bones of a child, of a 13 to 14 year old child from Waterford. And um, I, this actually created a storm throughout the world. I was on Japanese newspaper, The Observer, Canadian radio, whatever. Um, and it was all to do with these bones. I had a, I did an article uh, on um, the findings from Waterford. And one of them was actually, is this syphilis or not? And of course, I was on the Pat Kenny show and people were, the radio show and people were ringing me saying, it was St. Brendan that brought syphilis to Ireland and, you know, and so on. They were making a joke of it. But I actually, the reason why I, I, I one of the suggestions was syphilis or tuberculosis. The, I have the, the rest of the skeleton was found as well. But you see the, radi the, the radius, the ulna and the humeri, the upper arms, really. You can see on the, the, at the very bottom, low, the lower left, there's like a cystic type type. Over, um, oval circular remains or little indentations on the scaphoid process there of the scapula. And these are cysts. Up at the top, you can see little openings, little holes where osteo, if they're osteomyelitis, they're actually full of pus, if you like, draining rotten bone from, from the body. And you can see there are indentations as well near those little holes. So the person had some infective process. Now, what it was, all you can ever do with archaeological remains and actually things is identify them, photograph them. There were the skull also had um, little indentations on it, which were like a cyst on the on the, the mandible and on the on the, the skull. Whether they, the person had a couple of diseases or just one disease, I don't know. But it created a storm, and so much so that. The reason why it created a storm, not just because it was syphilis, but because it was syphilis in a medieval grave before 1492. And I don't know if you know the story of syphilis. It's called Louis Venera, the, the, the um, disease of Venus, the god, the god of love, because sexual contact at one stage was one of the, the reasons for contacting the disease. And um, when Columbus came back from America in 1493, I think it was, there was an epidemic or a pandemic of syphilis throughout Europe. And like dozens and hundreds of people died from it. So Columbus was blamed for bringing back that from a, from a foreign country. And it spread into Spain, to France and so on. And th throughout the, the end of the 15th century, and the beginning of the 16th century, it was a pandemic really, but it settled down after a while and became endemic. But Columbus may not have been, may not at all have been responsible for bringing syphilis in. It could have been a disease that was in Europe before that, and it just rose to pandemic proportions. Because with epidemiology, as we all know, experts at it lately, unfortunately, diseases change and they changed for certain reasons. It could be that there was clustering of people in medieval Europe, people were coming in from the countryside, there were jobs in the, in the towns, and maybe the, the disease went mad and spread like mad, like wildfire. But it was actually mentioned in the edict of uh, the, the diet of worms, if you remember in history, which was discussed at that, that people who had syphilis should not be treated by doctors, that they should be treated they should be isolated and left left out in the middle of the wilderness, literally, and forgotten. So one of the things why we don't find bones like this uh, often is maybe because they're buried in leper cemeteries with the lepers, because they were they were mixed up in with the the the, the um, 
identifying them by medical people in medieval times. They identified the two of them really as one and that you could pick up one anyway. I don't think they had it. Uh, they identified them as separate diseases in some cases at all. So um, they could be in the, 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 the leper cemeteries, you know, the, the leper cemeteries in Ireland. And there are several of those around. And they, they're obviously, no, a lot of them are known, so they would be avoided. This is just um, the, the, com the comings and goings from Columbus in 1492. Um, then the other thing that we, um, I'm just trying to catch up now here because I, uh, I have a load of slides, but I won't keep it that long more anyway. But um, one of the causes of, like one of the things people ask about a skeleton or a human remains, what did they die from? And all again you can do is describe what the person had, what conditions they had, and so forth. This is a hip, the hip bones of a female with her hands down towards her, her hips. And in the middle, you see these tiny little scattered small bones. And when I was exiting, well, when I was working, directing some excavations, one person in particular said to me, I think I found a cat with this woman. And the little bones, but it wasn't a cat. It was the bones like a cat and it was a fetus. And again, you don't often find, in a, in a medieval cemetery, you don't often find fetal remains like this because they're so delicate, they would erode very easily. But again, I don't know what this woman died from, but she died in pregnancy with the baby, with the fetus, maybe full term fetus. The remains are full term size. Um, maybe she died when the baby had engaged, was, she might've been coming into labor. But she did have anemia in, uh, indicated by little pathologies in her, in her eye sockets. She may have been anemic. She may have not got nourishment. Um, for pregnancy, nutrition was very poor in, 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 in historic times up to not so long ago. And um, what I did find in another skeleton that I found like this, another female who, was, um, who died in, in pregnancy, there was a, a, a wad of mortar joining her pubic bones as if, they, I wondered, I'd never seen anything like it before, but I wondered was it to keep the baby in so that it wouldn't slip out when she was being buried? Was it a wad of mortar or something? I'm just guessing, but I had never seen anything like that before. Uh, one other researcher in England described something similarly. Um, but human remains of, of fetal remains, they're usually buried in the Kilina, the, the little cemeteries in the, for unbaptized babies. So um, that's why you don't get a lot of human remains of, of, in a full cemetery, you know, they're in the, they're in the Kilina and their remains are actually quite, um, quite friable really in, in many respects. Then the other cause of and cause of death. A lot of when I was teaching paleodemography, I taught about the, the age of death, the, the life expectancy of people. It, at, at zero, your life expectancy to get to five was very slim, really, because in the first year of life, about 50% of babies would have died from many conditions. I mean, diseases were rife in, in past and in prehistoric and historic times. And uh, um, so when the chances of you living to be 25, if you were a male, was slim because you were often sent to war in some historic societies. Um, and pregnancy was a high killer for, for women. Infectious disease, um, tuberculosis, smallpox, um, and so on and so on. There are a pleasure of diseases, again, that would have killed humans. And most of them wouldn't show on the skeleton at all. Then the one most obvious sign of death is, is a weapon injury. And this is somebody, this is to remind me that somebody's head is on the block with um, an ax. And this, this um, I just skipped through it. This bone here is the lower part of a mandible. You can see where I have the head on the skeleton bent down and the arrow shows where the, the, where the impact was made by a sword. And what you see is the lower part, when you put your head down to be 
executed when your head is chopped off, your mandible, the, the lower part of your mandible gets chopped as well. If you, if you see the way it's, the, 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 the arrow is going there. And what I have here on the lower part of the mandible, you can see there's a slice that's taken in that mandible. There's another slice at the other side. And I found this mandible by itself in, in, a, in one context, in a, in a graveyard in Waterford. And the reason, I, it was the first time I had seen a cut mark in a human remain, and I, I knew it, it, it was shiny. There were striations, and you could see the way, the, the, the direction of the, the weapon, the, the, sword, the sword that went through it. And um, it, if the person had survived, there would be healing and remodeling of the bone, but they wouldn't have survived something like this anyway. But that's the difference between healed bone and unhealed bone. And it shine, the surface is shiny, so you can tell that the blood was flowing through it at the time of impact by the, by the, 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 the weapon. I could go on about that, but I just fly through there. You can imagine the effect of a sword or a halberd injuring somebody or actually fatally injuring somebody. But look, I'll show you these. These are, I'll just skip through these very, very quickly. A friend of mine, Ito O'Brien, drew these for me for when I was doing the Halloween talks, you know, um, just to show how you can identify a right-handed, a right-handed fighter with a weapon. You can actually identify an impact on somebody, whether they were from a left-handed person or a right-handed person. You can, you can reenact the whole fight if you like. Um, and I'll just keep, this is a sore chop to the frontal bone. See where the arrow is, there's a, a curved, shiny mark. And that person did not survive because otherwise the, body, the bone would have healed. I'll just take some of these. And um, this was one of, a, of um, a nest of skulls that were found, was found in Dublin many years ago by the River Poddle. And I presume that there were, there were skulls that were impaled on the, the palisade around the Pale of Dublin. This is just a um, cause of death. You can see it was gruesome. Her children posed for these pictures <laughs> with their with, with axes and whatever else. But there you can see the heads that are impaled on the, the towers of, of the, 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 the pale in Dublin. Pretty gruesome and uh, uh, you know, it's quite common as well. Now, the other thing about cutting, cutting heads and impact of implements, weapons on heads is you don't always know if the weapon injury was was just to cut off the head and the person had died from an, another injury, maybe to the heart or an artery somewhere in the body. But um, all you can say again is that it occurred at the time of death. So here's um, a, 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 another bone from that, that collection. You can see where the word causes, you can see a slice. Yeah, can you see the slice, the shiny parallel striations that are in that where the arrow is? This was actually a head that had three injuries to it, um, weapon injuries. So the head was hanging off, it wasn't even done properly. You can imagine that they didn't always have such a sharp implement in those days. And they had tried three times to cut his head off and it was just, the head was hanging off at the end. It was pretty gruesome. This, this is another one. You can see my hand is holding the front, the top of the skull. And you can see the, the nuchal crest. You see there's a little uh, above the arrow. It shows you where it is in relation to the skull. And you can see a circular mark. Can you see the circular mark? When I got this skull, it was in pieces and I reconstructed it and found this. And there, was an, there were three, excuse me, there were three um, sword marks from on this particular skull as well. Then just the last thing that I'll just discuss quickly um, is city of Cork, a medieval um, Dominican priory outside the walls, a, a, um, a place for refuge, a place where people he were healed, and a place where people had a holiday if you were rich, you know, like the Fitzgeralds and so on in medieval times, they would have gone there for recuperation and resuscitation. Uh, excavation of the Garth and the Cloisters, 
in the Dominican Priory in the 90s, revealed lots of skeletons, some in, in stone lined graves, others in wooden graves, and others just in, in a linen, in a, in probably in a cloth burial, which has now rotted. Um, there were several individuals who were buried up at the top of the church. We found the ruins of the church. They were up near the altar. And there were men who had died in, in some sort of battle or warfare. And you can see where the, where the, where the this is, um, the, I think, yes, yeah, the Olna and the, I have it there, shirt Mark, it's the Olna and the radius. And you can see a crack in the top bone. And you can also see a crack in the right hand side. There are two cut marks there. So the person in my scenario, I haven't been trying to defend himself. And um, we, and he was he got weapon marks then from um, an assailant. And the next part of his his um, in, the weapon injuries to him, you can see in the middle of the tibia there. There's a chop mark. And it goes right across to the broken bone. Do you see what I mean? The chop mark, and it, it, so that's another slice to his right lower limb. And they're not healed, so he died from the impact of these and was buried in the up in the top of the church with two or three other knights or whatever, or warriors, whatever you'd like to call them, in medieval times. This is um, another individual's left wrist area, the radius. You see the slice marks, there are three of them there. The top and his bit of bone fell out as well. It was loose in his body. And the, where the two centimeter mark is, there's a slice there. And below that then there's another slice. So again, another unhealed dead, dead war, war, warrior or knight or whatever. This is just a picture of the Dominican Priory reconstructed a place of welfare really looking after people and not alone that but they also had skills surgical skills and this is what I'm discussing next I actually use this in one of my short stories where the person has a dream and he's undergoing this operation in his dream which comes true and he's got a trepanation or surgery to his skull and um, these are the, just the Dominican priors that are carrying out the the surgery and here we, this is one of the trepanation pieces of equipment. And you can see a person, has been, their skull has been drilled into. Now they wouldn't have, they would have had lots of ways of combating the pain with, with, with various herbs and so on. And they would also have herbs for antiseptic properties and so on. But um, in, in Process Green, the Dominican Priory, there were two individuals who had this operation. They also, they had healed as well, which is amazing. They were really very well healed so that you did have a great social welfare. You had knowledgeable surgery in medieval court and you have trepanation all over the world in prehistoric and historic context. It was very well known and people were very skilled at this operation. The reason for it was probably pressure on the skull, releasing pressure, some injury. And in, in, other, in some countries, they took a talisman out of the person's skull um, to, 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 if they were an important person or if they had some physical attribute that they wanted, they might take a bit a roundel out of their skull as a talisman. All sorts of things I could go on and on about. But this is, um, this is the, one of the skull trepanations. You can see the skull, the, the marks on the skull, the mark on the skull. This was a skull I also reconstructed. It was in tiny bits. And you can see the opening where it's nicely healed. There's no sharp edges to the hole. And you can see where they scraped down into the skull to, to remove the roundel of bone. And the person lived whatever happily with headaches maybe thereafter. They may have suffered from um, epileptic fits, from whatever brain injury, or they may have just have been lived oblivious to the, the injury they had um, or what, for whatever reason, but it just shows you the skill that was there in medieval Ireland, in, in historic Ireland as well. And I think I'll end at that because I could keep going on and on and on and on. <laughs> 
you're there. It's 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 like a, a feast of pathology if you're interested in that. And there's a story to every single one of these. I could go on forever. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, thanks a million, Catherine. And we could certainly stay here, um, stay oh, here yeah. listen, listening to you as well. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I've just got a couple of questions uh, come in. Um, uh, one there from Elaine Hurley, and Elaine is asking, uh, did any of the projects have a particular impact on yourself? I'm interested in all of them, really. Not in, not, not, no one in particular. I suppose the, the, um, the, the little child in Emlock and Dingle, you know, in, in the middle of nowhere, for whatever reason, that she was buried there, maybe from con some contagious disease, that, and actually keep mothers in, chi in childbirth as well. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. it's all very tragic if you look at it from one way. But then again, um, you know, that's what archaeology and science is about, is looking at our past, really, as long as we respect the dead we're looking at, you know, and look after them as well. And, and I have a question myself, and it's one that a friend of, of mine, Ben, often raises, and you're talking about respect for, for the dead, but Ben would often raise the point that a lot of these uh, remains, when they are recovered, they're stored in warehouses and boxes and, and, and such like. Would you have any thoughts yourself on that, Catherine, or any? I do. I actually, the Waterford remains were reburied. And a lot of remains that I was involved with were reburied because we had promised the various people of the time that they should be reburied. Um, but the museum now, the Nat Nat National Museum and the legislation, indicates that they should be stored if they're archaeological. The problem is they don't have enough storage for them. Um, in, a, in, the new, in the new world, in North America and Australia, they have all these repatriation patriation, um, discussions as well. I had lots of students come over from America because they weren't allowed to deal with um, Aboriginal Native American Indian skeletons anymore because they were all reburied, which is fair enough if that's what you if that's what they wanted, you know, you have to think of the ethics of all of this as well. And I think if you can avoid excavating a skeleton as much as we, if you can avoid excavating a cemetery or a graveyard, I think that's the best way forward. Um, you know, because there will be plenty of others that you, that will be moved and moved on and removed. You know, if they're in the way, so to speak. Thanks, thanks, Catherine. There's a question from. Nia, is it possible um, to find evidence if a body has been embalmed by its skeletal remains? Um, it depends on where it's preserved. If it's actually preserved in a wooden coffin or in a lead coffin, you probably could, yeah, you could. But um, in a dry skeleton on a, in an acidic site, I'd say no. But in a peaty site, you might get some remains. If it's covered in something, if it's covered in clothing, or if it's in a certain type of coffin where it's, it's well preserved. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Catherine. A question from uh, Claire. Um, can you ask Catherine if she's come across any items inserted into cavities or of corpses to prevent bodily fluids leaking out? Well, no, the, the, the martyr that I found in that female with the, with, with, that, was, mm -hmm. that died in pregnancy, that's the only one that I, that I ever saw anything like that of. I'd say that they're not, they mightn't be considered as part of the archaeology because they might be considered as mortar falling from a wall or something on top of the grave, you know, but it was like chalk, actually. Okay, thanks, Catherine. There's um, a question in from Fanula, who, who, who uh, joined us for a lecture herself uh, during the summer. Can you tell us a bit more about the bog body that you found, Catherine? The bog body. I doomed that it's in the National Museum now. It was There's an article written on it actually. Um, it's on. It's in. I think it might be the Cork Historical and Archaeological Journal. That there's a, there's a full article on it with the clothing, and they go into depth about the weaves that the clothing was made and how it was. It was um, clothing that was re reused from somebody else from a bigger child, and it. It, it was cut, there were, it, was, it was actually different fabrics, you know, um, but um, 
there was a little purse and there was, a, I think, a little wooden ball or something like that found in the purse. And then there was the poem. I think they're in the National Museum, but um, no. O'Kelly and she, Elizabeth too, it would be, they, they wrote the article on it and they would have a lot more information. I think mainly it's on the, 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 the material, really, that it, there's a lot of material that was involved, you know, and that's all I know really about it. Okay, thanks, Catherine. I, just a, an, an area of history I'm interested in myself, but did you ever come across any any missing uh, bodies or missing people from either the War of Independence era, era or Civil War period in, our, in Ireland? Well, I mean, you could find those individuals, but they'd want to have certain um, gunshot wounds, injuries, you know, to, before you could uh, identify them. I did help in the removal and of some of them all right over the years to make sure that they weren't going to be disturbed and there were various monuments put in on the public ground and all of that but um it, 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 it would um they're pro i haven't really as such you know but um maybe there there is i know i don't really know i can't comment on that anymore except okay. speculate you know Okay, and one final question, and, and Martin is working on a great project here in Kilkenny on, on DNA and family history. Uh, he's asking, have any of your excavated remains been tested for DNA, and if so, what did they find? Um, I've dealt with DNA on, before DNA became popular, actually, to be quite honest, but I can't mention the sites because they're modern. It wouldn't do to mention them now, you know? Um, here and um, there were suggestions all right I can't remember I know that there are now it's, I, I have to put my thinking cap on we'll have to get you back for another yeah, at the moment it doesn't come to mind. we'll have to get you back for yeah, a, I, another I, lecture I, Catherine we could we could listen to you all night you have you. to get someone on DNA we, we will yeah, you have to get someone that's expert on DNA yeah, I, I might just know someone who, who might be interested. I give in you a name. <laughs> Catherine, yeah, yeah, thanks a million. Catherine, Thank you thanks, so much. thanks so much for joining us. Um, fascinating lectures. Loads of brilliant comments uh, coming in here. We'll send them all on to you by email. Thanks again brilliant. for joining yes. us. Thank you so much for the invitation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank yeah, you very thanks much. I'm delighted. Thank you very bye, much. Everyone. Bye. Thank bye. You.